Welcome to 4 E Radio, where the gospel's for the believer and the unbeliever alike. That's everybody. Even Troy. I'm Craig to know for your pastor of St. James Lutheran Church in the old Brooklyn neighborhood of Cleveland, Ohio. Who are you, senior? Uh, I am consistently fascinated that you'd put me into some other, other category than believer or unbeliever. Look, if Christ could <sighs> die for you, he can die for anyone. That's a good point. That's, <laughs> That's a good. Chief of sinners, though I be. Though you be. Yeah, yeah uh, Jesus shed his love for Pastor Troy Neer, St. Peter's Lutheran Church, Shaker Heights, Ohio. There you go. Come visit That's our me. churches. Yeah, We'd yeah. love to have you worship with us. Hey, this is Good Friday. It's hard to believe. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. so you, you can come to St. James Saturday, 5 p.m. for Easter Vigil, uh, Sunday morning for worship, 10, 15 a.m. What time are your services, Troy? Uh, well, for Good Friday, we have the Tenebrae service at 7 p.m. Yeah, we do, too. Uh, yeah. Okay. And uh, Easter morning, a little bit later than usual. We go about 10.30 on Easter Ooh, morning. Ooh, sleeping yeah, yeah. in. So you don't do the sunrise thing. <laughs> Weird thing that when I got to uh, St. Peter's about six years ago now, uh, they all looked at me really strange, like, sunrise service? What? I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> My take on sunrise yeah. is Jesus rose from the dead in Israel, so you should do it sunrise Israel time. Which, which would... I'm, I'm thinking, I can't remember, it's either 3 p.m. or 10 p.m. here. Okay. I, right. I looked it up once, I can't so remember So, my was. best sunrise service story is that uh, one year, my family and I literally woke up 15 minutes before the service began. Yikes. <laughs> and we still all got there. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, anyway, we are also a broadcast slash podcast of 1517.org. Go to 1517.org backslash podcasts and find all sorts of good stuff there. Many, many podcasts, all sorts of great stuff. 1517.org. Yeah. You can also do video courses with people like Dr. Adam Francisco. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. Yes. Who's here to speak with us today about the apologetics of the resurrection. Dr. Adam Francisco is director of academics and scholar in residence at 1517.org. He earned his DPhil from University of Oxford and has Ooh. two decades of Oxford. experience. Oxford. Yes. <laughs> Oxford. Oxford. Oh, yes. <laughs> Jolly good. Uh, and has two decades of experience teaching history, philosophy, and theology, as well as apologetics. Co-host of the Thinking Fellows podcast, author, author, author of, of many books and articles. Go to 1517.org, put his name in the little search engine and see what you see, all sorts of stuff. And we have been doing his uh, apologetics course one Wednesday a month at St. James, and people are loving it. It's it's a little heavy at times, but it's good. Adam, welcome to 4E Radio. Hey, I'm glad to be here. I put you to sleep with all that. He's, he's like, yeah, I know, I've heard all this before. He's, he's just looking, he's looking bashful right now, like... Uh... So we are talking today because it is Holy Week. We are talking about the apologetics of the resurrection. How do we know that Jesus rose from the dead? Did he just rise in your heart? Did he rise for real? How do you know? Oh, well, that's what we're talking about today. So, oh, good. Okay, Adam. If I were to ask you, uh, well, you know, how do we know Jesus actually rose from the dead? You know, the Bible says these things, but. How do we know this for sure? Where, where's your first line of defense on this? What, what do you say? Well, it's it's a little different than the Bible says he did. It's that the eyewitnesses said he did. Um, you know, we have not well, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, two of which were eyewitnesses, two were companions of eyewitnesses, uh, who who detail. Mark's not nearly as detailed, but uh, they tell us that he rose from the dead uh not as i mean matthew mark luke and john are inspired by the holy spirit to be sure okay but there are also good historical eyewitness accounts of what happened or accounts based on eyewitness testimony of what happened especially in the last three years of of jesus life we have other uh evidence however um for the resurrection, you go to First Corinthians 15. Again, that's a New Testament text, but it is a historical document. And in fact, most historians or uh, scholars of the New Testament, whether they are Christian believers or not, regard First Corinthians as one of the earliest texts that we have uh, in terms of when it was written. And Paul in, in chapter 15 is very clear 
uh, that Jesus rose from the dead, not in your heart, but as a matter of historic fact, that you can actually go. He names a couple eyewitnesses and says there, there are even about 500 people still around today uh, that you could go and ask about uh, these events. Uh, and then he goes a little further and says something quite bold, something that no other religion really does, and says, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, if this event did not happen, Christianity would be a lie, that mm. uh, Christians would be the most pitiable of all people because they believed in a lie. They're still dead in their trespasses and sins. So uh, it, in the resurrection is one of those things that, uh, you know, if you were to ask you know, philosophers, that makes Christianity ultimately falsifiable. And that, that might sound kind of shocking, you know, that, that suggests that Christianity can be proven false, but that actually is kind of its greatest strength. Uh, all the other religions out there are effectively what the author of Second Peter would maybe call a cleverly devised myth. Christianity mm. is a, a claim that can be looked into, uh, and it's, it's contingent upon certain facts being true, namely the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Uh, Dr. Paul Meyer uh, says that he thinks that the Gospel of Luke may be a uh, defense that Luke is putting together for Paul, who's in prison. And he goes and does all this eyewitness work, which is really, really cool. And this is part of what you're pointing out is we have the witness of more than 500 people who said, yes, we saw all these things and this this truly happened. Uh, the Romans had a, a really good track record of when they crucified you, making sure you were good and dead. Uh, so there are all these theories out there, some of them uh, like the swoon theory and that sort of thing, where mm. uh, Jesus just passed out and they wrapped him up in these linens and stuck him in a grave. And then he uh, woke up in the cool dew of the tomb and pushed <laughs> away a several hundred pound boulder and overpowered two guards there. And, it, you know, it, it kind of <laughs> seems to become a little more fantastic than just he rose from the dead. <laughs> uh, you know, we have these theories. How, how do you respond to those theories? Um, so, yeah, I, I'm trying to get the chuckles out of my head because those the, all the theories, whether it's the swoon theory that you just referred to or they're – the two more popular ones today, because the swoon theory, while there are still people who will hang on to it, it's, I think it was first proposed in the sixties or seventies. It's old and it's, there's just no way to maintain it. The, um, uh, I think it's the journal of the American medical association. So the peer reviewed journal for physicians and so on, uh, ran an essay decades ago where some historian who was also a physician analyze all the evidence we have, the primary source evidence we have, and he says there's just no way anybody could come to any other conclusion than the fact that Jesus actually did die on the cross. When the spear was thrust into his side and blood and water came out, that's proof positive, but there's more things to it, too, uh, that his pericardial sac had been right. pierced. Uh, he's dead. Uh, but the two big theories today, at least that I encounter, uh, on the part of those who do take the 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 gospel text, I'm using air quotes. Your hearers or listeners won't see this, but uh, those who take them kind of seriously, they'll say, "Yeah, the the gospel texts are." And like one name here would be a person like Bart Ehrman. Mm -hmm. you know, they say the gospel texts are the best sort of sources we have for the the life and teachings of Jesus. However, we can't trust everything they say because they report that there are certain things like miracles happen, namely the resurrection. And so they'll say uh, probably what best accounts for the empty tomb on Sunday morning uh, is either the disciples went to the wrong tomb oh, or they experience all together and in various places kind of a mass hallucination. They believed they saw a actual risen Jesus but in fact, it was just a hallucination. Really? So the, those sorts of theories, I mean, those are theories. What's interesting with them all is they all acknowledge, one, a Jesus was crucified on a cross, which is a you know brute historic fact. 
and a burial in a tomb and an empty tomb on Easter morning. That Those are all brute historic facts. Mm-hmm. So the, the historian's question is, how do you account for that empty tomb? And if you're a historian doing, if you're doing like legitimate history, when you're trying to explain a certain historic phenomenon, you need to, your uh, explanation has to be ordered around the facts that you ha- we have. And the facts that we have all say that Jesus was walking around for 40 days. Right. After the alleged resurrection, after the, that first Easter morning. So why are these other, why are there these other theories? I would, the way I think about it is, and I think this is not just me, but it, those other theories are not driven by some sort of fact somebody's uncovered, but rather driven by an assumption people make that dead people can't rise, hmm. that Jesus just could not have risen from the dead. And right. that's not a factual, um, claim that's more of a philosophical assumption it's wedded to what we might just simply call the philosophy of materialism or naturalism that all things have to be a, explained by appealing to natural uh causes which that doesn't i mean that's that seems okay right but then the, then there are lots of examples or lots of things that you really can't explain by appealing to natural causes for example how nature got here in the first place Mm. You, you so, mean, uh, just the origins of of the universe yeah i yeah. mean how, how are you going to i mean if the universe is let's just say kind of in a general way basically nature how do you explain how it according to I mean, the current big bang theory which says that it all emerged from nothing how how did it all come into yeah, there there has to be okay. an unseen mover somewhere yeah yes so that that actually uh so the big bang theory and the other stuff you mentioned about the um, let's call them skeptics uh, of the actual physical resurrection. Uh, it seems to me we could place a lot of those folks in the category of uh, maybe a hostile witness. That yes. they, uh, they agree on all the same points of the story that we trust in, that we believe, upin- believe upon, uh, but then uh, because of their presuppositions, they have to come to a different conclusion. Yes. that That's an outsta- a very nice, clean way of describing what really is the issue? It's not that there are facts slash evidence that that say Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Rather, it's because people come to the the evidence or the story, if you will, of Jesus with different assumptions about what can and cannot be. So there, you're not in the realm of what historians are working in with facts. You're not in the realm of of uh, those sorts of things, you're in the realm of what people assume to be true in the first place. And that's, in my mind, you know, having done, I, I guess, maybe 20 years now of work in apologetics, sometimes in the classroom, sometimes it's kind of, if you will, on the street or it's in the mosque. What I've encountered time and time again is, and sadly, I think, is people will believe what they assume can be true in the first place rather than look in a kind of neutral or unbiased way at the facts and assess those. And that, so that suggests that um, uh, the issue with the resurrection, whether one believes it or not, is an issue of the will. Right. Uh, it, it seems that a lot of people will kind of come at you with the, you can't prove that there's a God, and therefore there's no God. And, well, wait a minute here, let's, <laughs> let's talk about this, right? Uh, you know, so they, they come with their presuppositions and their ideas, uh, you know, they say, well, the resurrection is just too fantastical to to believe in. But what about this mass hallucination where everybody sees the same thing? Uh, you dump a bunch of LSD and the Kool-Aid at uh, Woodstock, everyone's going to see some different thing, you know? I mean, they're going to see, they're going to all have a different trip here. <laughs> so if if this sort of thing was happening somehow, how how could it be that everybody sees the same thing? And isn't that as as fantastical in and of itself as the resurrection? A really great uh, point. In fact, I think it's today, maybe it's tomorrow. I have a a friend who's a former student of mine who has written a several papers and in fact, a book on the question on what's called the delusion or mass hysteria hypothesis. Hmm. And, you know, it's, it's a scholarly length book, but to put it real, 
um, shortly or simplistically, he argues that if you look at the way even contemporary psychological standards or even psychological standards going back two, two centuries, it is true individuals can hallucinate and see remarkable things, but that a whole bunch of people, maybe up to 500, saw exactly the same thing is a would be a, a miracle itself. Right. So people hallucinate individually, but for them all to have the same sort of hallucination uh, just is not supported by any sort of psychological, if you will, mm. evidence. So a question that I have that kind of stems from that, uh, dating back to at least the 1800s, I know uh, there's this theory that Jesus rose uh, in a spiritual resurrection. Uh, how would we uh, argue or give an apology for the actual physical resurrection of Jesus over and against a merely spiritual resurrection? Man, we have, I'm looking at the timer, 10 minutes left, and that's that's a very long discussion. Um, let me let me say two things. Well, uh, just, One is, I would, I'd like to say normally that Craig would pose that question with about 45 seconds left, so. That, that Come on, it's right. more like 30, 30 <laughs> seconds, right. 30 seconds. Um, one is... Uh, I would say there there is a a side to American well it's not just American Christianity but mainline Protestantism that would emphasize this and I'm gonna I, I'm gonna just sort of point to a book not just sort of but I'm going to point to a book not physically or literally but that was written about a hundred years ago by a guy named J Gresham Machen called Christianity and Liberalism. Or maybe it's liberalism and Christianity. I can't remember the order. I think he got it right the first time. Okay. Well, he argued, and quite rightly, that, and what he's liberal Protestantism, of which one of the features is that Jesus' resurrection is not a historic bodily fact, but rather just a spiritual fact, if you will, is not Christianity. Uh, secondly, those who would say that the, the resurrection of Jesus was just spiritual, uh, Paul would, would respond saying, wait a minute, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead bodily, this is all a scam. I mean, you guys, I'm not a, a pastor, um, so I'm going to point at you guys on the screen here on Zoom. You've wasted however long you've been in the ministry, and your listeners, however long they've gone to church, <laughs> they've wasted their time. If Jesus didn't physically rise from the dead. But we've we've gotten so fantastically average middle class on this. Uh, you know, I mean, it's we've been <laughs> we've benefited so moderately from it all. So, you know, it's got to be a scam, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I there's... mean, you know, I mean, the idea is like, oh, yeah, the apostles, they must have gotten rich off this. No, they all died miserable deaths. Yes. Defending yeah. this well, all the way to the grave. I mean, th the only people who get rich off this are people who are on TV and doing fake healings and stuff. Uh, you know, those who are defending the resurrection are not the ones living in the mansions. You, you mentioned the, the name Paul Meyer uh, before. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a deep and abiding love for Paul Meyer. When my, so I have a, a, I wasn't born yet, but my oldest brother died of cancer when my parents were at university. I think it was well, wherever Paul Meyer taught. I think it was a Kalamazoo, Michigan, right. yeah, yeah. a Michigan, Michigan state or Eastern Michigan, uh, Western, and Western Michigan, Western Michigan. So my parents were there. My oldest brother died of cancer and Paul Meyer was their first, was their chaplain through that oh. whole awful ordeal. Um, but uh, Paul Meyer has a, a, a saying, it's not a doctrine. I don't know what, to, I, I'm just going to call it a saying that, Myths don't make martyrs. Hmm. So oh, yeah. all of the apostles, with the exception of John, went to their death. And the, their deaths were oftentimes horrific. You know, it could be a, a crucifixion upside down. It could be being shot through with arrows. You know, you'd have to read Eusebius, the first church historian mm -hmm. on, on, on these traditions. But um, Which I suggest you don't do because it's very depressing. <laughs> Very, very much so. Yeah. But at the same time, kind of encouraging, you know, in that, in that, mm. hey, these, these folks went to their death claiming something to be true, like factually true. Had they all kind of cooked it up as a, a conspiracy theory or something, somebody would have fessed up to it, mm. you know? Right. Um, 
Now, there are people, lots and lots of people, I'm thinking of the, the jihadists out there who, who die believing a lie. But it would be a psychological miracle if people died believing or died confessing something untrue that in fact, or con- confessing something was true that in fact they knew to be untrue. That they knew to be untrue. Yeah. Yeah. So, so not, not deceived and not believing a lie, but something that they knew that they had, in the case of the apostles, had they concocted this story. Correct. Um, yeah. yeah. And okay. that that's Paul Meyer's, um, one of his... One of the features of his, uh, I, I think it's, well, he's got it in several works. His um, his translation of Eusebius's church or ecclesiastical history and his, mm-hmm. I think it was called In the Fullness of Time was its original mm, yeah. um, right. title. Uh, outstanding stuff. Well, while we're so on you Paul just can't Meyer, get around it. Yeah, while we're on Paul Meyer, yeah. uh, I have uh, a fictionalized novel of his. Skeleton in God's Closet. Yeah, that's a fun book. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, uh, it's it, a page turner. It's, it's really actually, well it kind of details this very thing where supposedly yes. someone has discovered Jesus's skeleton. Right. And what happens to the faith mm-hmm. after that? Uh, and of course, he ends up uh, where we should end up that there, no, there was an actual physical resurrection. Dush. You're going to wreck the book. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Spoiler alert. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could go to Amazon and read a review and get a spoiler alert. Sure. But yeah. On that. That book, so my uh, my father, who's a now retired Missouri Synod pastor, before he became a pastor, would you know he did a youth group or you know a, you know Sunday school for for decades at our, my church growing up, and on Easter morning, I remember he would go into I don't know if it was always, but he would oftentimes go into his class, uh, kind of excited. My dad was a information systems guy, so kind of a math we'd call it a techie kind of geek, you mm-hmm. know, not very excitable, but he would go in and work himself up into excitement and come rushing into the classroom and say, can you all believe this? They found Jesus bones. Isn't this incredible? We now know he really did exist. And he'd wait for the reaction. <laughs> oh, And if the reaction was, Oh, that's awesome. Where, where do you see that? This is before the internet, you know, so right. they weren't saying, let's bring it up on Google, but uh, and, you know, if, if people are saying, oh, that is incredible, he'd say, no, this would be the worst news of all, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Uh, that's how important the historic or bodily resurrection of Jesus really is. And I'm going to, I know we have just have a few minutes left, but there is a um, apostolic father. So the generation that comes after the apostles named first or f- named Clement of Rome. Mm. And of course, Catholics would say that's the first pope. He wasn't the first pope, but Clement of Rome uh, wrote an epistle. You can Google it and, and read it. Um, it's available in English translation and so on. But uh, I forget what chapter it is, but he says, what really convinced the apostles to begin preaching the gospel, and this is me summarizing or paraphrasing, uh, was that Jesus rose from the dead. What he suggests there is, had he not rose, the Christian church wouldn't even exist. Right. Because there'd be no reason to preach the gospel if he was dying in a, or if he was dead in a grave just another philosopher or good teacher who died and you know yeah maybe, yeah, maybe exactly. some of what he said is worth hanging on to but we're not going to hang our hats on this and right and put our heads on right. the line right yeah. Yeah. so so if i may then um something you said earlier adam just struck me as being really amazing that um uh the a belief in a spiritual resurrection is not christianity and, and so what we're kind of doing is kind of come around to this thing where ultimately uh Yes, the resurrection is still something that we need to believe upon by faith. Um, the scriptures have proclaimed it, but yet we have, uh, it's not an ill-informed faith. It's not a, uh, it's not a vacuous faith that has no uh, bearing upon historical events whatsoever, but it is a reliable and sure faith. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we cannot, by our own reason or strength, uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Um um, at the same time, I'm going to go to the first article and explanation for it in Luther's small catechism. He says that God has created us and all creatures. He's given us a reason and sense experience and still preserves them. Oh, so yeah. we, we believe that Jesus' resurrection from the dead uh, was for our justification only because the Holy Spirit has caused us to believe that. As a basic historic matter, we can know that the tomb was empty. Anybody can know the tomb was empty. 
and can maybe go a little further and realize that all the evidence says that Jesus was walking around. But whether that was for them or for you and for the rest of the world, that's purely uh, the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, 100%. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. We're talking with Dr. Adam Francisco. You can go to 1517.org and put his name in the search engine there, and you'll get all sorts of good stuff. I want to encourage you to consider taking his apologetics class, and if you have a church, use it with your church. It's it's a really fantastic class. You can talk about all these sorts of things or learn about all these sorts of things and so much more. Uh, Adam just before we head out, and we're talking about the resurrection here, are there any last thoughts that you'd like to leave everyone with? Uh, just that um, he is risen, and he's risen indeed. I know this is going to air on Good Friday, but uh, while Good Friday is a day uh, for reflection and repentance, um, three days later is when we all confess that uh, Jesus' death for our sins uh, was for our sins, but his his resurrection for, was ultimately for our justification. Amen. Adam, thanks so much for joining us. Until next time, be sure to listen to 4 E Radio next week. We'll pick up with Adam once again, but until next time, God's peace. 4 E Radio is a 1517.org production. To listen to this radio broadcast and podcasts and broadcasts like this one, I invite you to visit 1517.org. There you will also find many publications and free resources, including classes on Christian apologetics, church history, philosophy, and so much more. We are completely funded by generous donors like you. Would you consider making a generous gift to our work of spreading the gospel? Simply visit 1517.org.